Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our business and buzz segment brought to you by Revere Securities, we're featuring the awesome Paul Mann, chairman, CEO, and CFO of ASP Isotopes. Paul has more than 20 years of experience on Wall Street investing in healthcare and chemicals companies, having worked at Soros Fund Management, Highbridge Capital, and Morgan Stanley. He started his career as a research scientist at Procter & Gamble and was even named as the inventor of numerous skincare creams in the oil of ole range of cosmetics. Today, we're chatting, you guessed it, isotopes. Well, what is an isotope? Isotopes are atoms that have the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. But changing the number of neutrons in an atom does not change the element. Atoms of elements with different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes of that element. And isotopes have the same position on the periodic table and hence belong to the same chemical element. They actually all almost have the same chemical properties. ASP Isotopes is essentially an advanced materials company dedicated to the development of technology and processes designed to produce isotopes used in multiple industries. They are a leader in isotope enrichment technology for the medical, green energy, and industrial sectors. ASP Isotopes trades under ticker symbol ASPI. Welcoming now to the show is CEO and co-founder of ASP Isotopes, Paul Mann. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be here. All right, Paul, let's talk about your proprietary technology. So ASP has its origins in the South African Uranium Enrichment Program back in the 1980s. And the ASP technology has demonstrated efficacy and commercial scalability in the enrichment of oxygen 18 and silicone 28. You have an exclusive license to use this proprietary technology the aerodynamic separation process, hence ASP technology, for the production, distribution, marketing, and sale of all isotopes. Talk to me about this extremely proprietary technology. Yeah, so you know, there's been a long history in isotope separation, really started in the Second World War. And um, when you enrich an isotope, you're basically trying to separate these atoms out by by, by mass unit and, uh, and specific isotopes have got very specific properties that we can be that can find useful for very advanced technologies and things that will help us in the future. So, um, you know, when we, you know, we, we found the technology in South Africa about 24 months ago, it took a long time to acquire and buy the technology. Uh, we realized straight away this has a profound number of uh, applications in the world that will both help the world today and in many applications in the future. I think maybe one of the easiest ways to explain how this can be used, just take silicon 28 as an example. When you think about silicon, that goes into most semiconductors and solar panels. You see it, you see it and use it every day. But most sil you know, silicon 28, think about it pointing vertically or pointing in the flow of, di the flow of direction of the electrical current. But silicon 29 faces the opposite direction. It blocks the, blocks the electrical current. And so it, it shuts down the conductivity and the effectiveness of a semiconductor. If we can remove that silicon 29, the conductivity and effectiveness of a, of a microchip or a semiconductor increases hundreds of fold or thousands of fold. So when you think about the semiconductors of tomorrow, which are going to enable things like quantum computing, we have to remove that silicon 29 for, for, the, for these conductors to be able to be uh, effective enough to enable that technology. And our, our process allows us to remove certain isotopes of certain, certain elements to enable these technologies. So that's one of the easiest ones to explain, but we've got a number of isotopes in development and commercial you know, production or close to commercial production already. And, uh, and, and that, that's kind of what the goal of it, that's what, that's what the aim of the company is. Did that, does that answer your question? Yes, it's, it's very interesting because what you're saying is silicone 28, which you believe has the, the potential application in the quantum computing target end market is really one of those shining stars. And carbon-14, I know, uh, you believe has the potential application in the pharma, agrochemical target end market. So lots of cool stuff that you guys are doing. Um, I have an interesting question just as a general blanket question. When you talk about isotopes found in everyday life, not the complicated stuff, what are we really looking at? Like detection and treatment of cancer or is it geological experiments? What's the focus? That's right. So one of the most common radio nuclear uh, imaging processes in the world is something called a SPECT scan. 
And you have that to detect things like cancer or other abnormalities of your body. And in order to take a picture of an organ using a spec scan, you have to inject the patient with, with an isotope called molybdenum-99. And, and that has a six hour half-life. So it decays, it only lasts around for, you know, for less than a day or a very short period of time. And that isotope allow, you know, it basically emits a little particle that allows you to take a picture of a soft organ you can't take using an X-ray. Uh, and so that's a very common use of an isotope in every day. There's 30 million spec scans done every year in the United States. So that's a very common isotope that, that the world uses. And actually, our first isotope, or our first mass production isotope, would be molybdenum-100 that we expect to compete against molybdenum-99 in the spec scanning and in the radio imaging market. And, and you, yes, so let, let's talk about that. So you recently announced that you entered into a 25 year supply agreement for highly enriched uh, Mo 100 with Bryson, the Beijing Research Institute of Chemical Engineering um, Metallurgy. So it's you, so Mo 100 is used in the preparation of radio pharmaceuticals used in nuclear med medicine procedures to diagnose heart disease and, and cancer, to study organ structure and function and to, to perform other important medical applications. And this was a pretty good contract, a, a nice value for you. Uh, this is very proprietary. Talk to me about how this is solving real world issues, particularly the Mo 100. Yeah. So molybdenum 99 has a 66 hour half-life and it's produced in 10 nuclear reactors around the world. So a half-life means it halves in activity or value every 66 hours, every two and a half days. So right now you get this product out of a nuclear reactor somewhere not in the United States and it gets shipped around the world and finally gets to its end of, end, end of its journey where it's going to be used on a patient. But every two and a half days, it's halving in value. And not surprisingly, over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of supply chain problems. It ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Patients can't have their procedures. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, the FDA put it on its drug shortage list because there simply wasn't enough of it available. A couple of reactors have shut down the U.S., Many other countries around the world simply haven't got access to it right now because it's, it's in such short demand. The beauty about molybdenum 100 is it doesn't decay. It's a stable isotope. So you can ship it around the world in a normal package, FedEx or UPS or whatever you want. It, it, you keep it on the shelf as inventory and you can take it when you want to use it. So it solves a lot of that supply chain problem. And that's one of the things that really excited us about our first project was solving a problem that's been around for the last 15, 20 years in a very cost efficient and environmentally friendly way. That's fantastic. And the separation of isotopes um, has been important during the past century and has enabled some key activities. Talk to me about what these key activities are and what does the future hold for the separation of isotopes? Yeah, well, there are many ways to separate isotopes. Um, you know, the most basic method, or actually it's quite advanced, I guess, is, is using a centrifuge. And that's what you typically enrich uranium with. So when you think about a nuclear reactor that produces a lot of the energy for, for, for you and I every day, that uses, a, um, that uses uranium enriched to about you know, between three and a half and five percent. And what you do is you, you spin, you, there's a big tube, a, a cylinder, cylindrical tube that spins around very fast. And that creates essentially a vortex inside the tube and the heavier atoms go to the outside, the lighter ones stay on the inside and, um, and that allows you to enrich something for, an, for a heavier or a lighter isotope. Um, our process is slightly different and by the way, these centrifuges are massive operations, cost billions of dollars, uh, very, very complex. Um, our process is much more simple. We actually have a stationary tube, a stationary wall centrifuge and we spin the gas inside the tube and the heavier, heavier atoms go to the outside, lighter ones to the inside, and that's how we do it. So we have no moving parts in our, in, our, in our plants, apart from the compressors. So our plants are much cheaper to build, much smaller footprint, uh, easier to handle, number of advantages over historic methods of enriching isotopes. Well, it's, you guys are definitely at the forefront of this technology because in addition, I know that you're also considering the future development um, of the ASP technology for the separation of, of zinc 68, nickel 64, xenon 136. I mean, xenon 136 for potential use in the healthcare target and market, that's pretty interesting. And of course, we have uranium 235, chlorine 37. I mean, you, you are really a scientist, a, a, a chemist. A, you do this for a living. Talk to me about what the next say 48 months to to five years look like for a company like ASP? 
Yeah, thanks. So we're at a really exciting time, actually, in isotope development. I know it's not something you normally hear, exciting and isotopes in the same sentence, but we really are. There's a number of things driving that excitement. I guess there's a couple of supply side shocks that are affecting the market right now, and also some demand drivers as well. On the supply side, there's been a gradual shutdown of older facilities that, that produce isotopes. And then Russia has been one of the largest suppliers of isotopes over the last several decades. You know, Russia's I guess you know, many, many, many customers are looking at who their partners are here and who their suppliers are. And many are thinking they don't really want to be dealing with, with Russia or, or some of the other Asian countries that produces isotopes. So on the supply side, there's a real shock right now, one gradual, one sudden. On the demand side, there's a lot of new uses for isotopes evolving over the next five or 10 years. And you just mentioned some of them, zinc 68, silicon 28, nickel 64, Chlorine 37. There's lots of different isotopes that can't be. Lithium become... 6. Lithium 6 is another one. I mean, that's got huge potential uses next decade and in the future of, of nuclear fusion. Nuclear. Yeah. So there's a whole list of isotopes that are really interesting and they're going to evolve over the next five to 10 years that aren't currently produced and many of them can't be produced using centrifuges. And so, you know, we're having active discussions with lots of potential customers and partners to produce these isotopes for them. When you say what's going to happen or what do you want to happen in the next 24 to 48 months, you know, our focus right now is in getting our first two plants up and running and producing commercial quantities of product for customers. That's molybdenum 100 and carbon 14. And they will hopefully generate significant amounts of free cash flow for the company. And then we can reinvest that free cash flow to build additional plants. And, you know, we have customers wanting zinc 68 and silicon 28 as soon as possible. And so we'd expect to build a couple of new plants in the next few years to supply those customers with additional isotopes that aren't available today. This is fantastic. What a great solid company. You know, it, it's one thing to have something proprietary. It's another thing to have the technology. It's another thing to have a great board and, and great scientists behind it. And it's the one thing to have it all and you have it all and you have some, some great folks around you. So thank you so much for coming on. Very insightful. I learned a lot and definitely something to look out for. I, I'll, be, I'll be checking you on, on the on the trading floor is ASPI. That's the ticker symbol. Thank you for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. That was our business and buzz segment brought to you by Revere Securities. You definitely have to check out ASP Isotopes and Paul Mann. Head directly to their website, ASPIsotopes.com. Now there's a great example of a company solving real world issues using proprietary technology and doing it all the right way. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com.